Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Talking Tax with Tom Yamachika of the Tax Foundation, Foundation of Hawaii. And today's uh, show is entitled Getting Temporary Tax Fixes, with the emphasis on the word temporary, not what candidate uh, Green promised. Really important discussion now at the beginning of his administration. Uh, more from Tom in a moment. Welcome to the show, Tom Yamachika, President of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. So here we are um, in the um, you know first months, if you will, of the new administration, and we have the interesting uh, opportunity to compare uh, what the governor's position is now as against what it was when he was running for office. And you've looked into this. I wonder if you could give us the, the benefit of your observations. Sure. I'm your moving reporter today, reporting from the state capitol, which is behind me. And I actually, I, I really was just there uh, speaking with some of our legislative leaders. The issue we have uh, is that uh, candidate Green, when he was running for governor, made a number of very dramatic proposals. Uh, like eliminating the general excise tax on food and medicine. So those were a number of, I mean, that's, that, that's pretty big. Uh, and it was a big promise. Uh, and uh, it has to go to the legislature first. And legislative leaders are saying, mm, I don't think we can do this. They are kind of like treating uh, Governor Green like a little kid. Oh, well, I'm trying to think of his experience with fiscal policy. I don't know if he was on the fiscal committees when he was in the legislature. Uh, he hasn't talked much in the past about it. Um, he's been, you know, focused on COVID and public health issues um, and, um, you know, making public statements around those issues. But I, I haven't, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't associated him with statements about fiscal policy. Has he made statements about that before? Well, just some statements about, number one, giving us the exemption for uh, food and medicine. Uh, two, he's talked about uh, the visitor green fee, uh, which is a, a tax that he was thinking of levying on uh, tourists when they come here. Of course, locals would be exempt from that. Uh, and then uh, there was some mention uh, by his housing people about uh, the empty homes tax, which we've talked about before, uh, that people uh, who live elsewhere but have vacation homes or such over here uh, would be subject to a punitive uh, tax for every month or so that the a unit remains vacant and is not rented to like a, a local person who needs housing. None of those have ever um, materialized, have they? Well, it, really, it's still early in the process. And typically, we see uh, the uh, governor's proposals in terms of bills uh, come in later this month, uh, beginning of February, uh, in the legislative session. So uh, that hasn't happened yet. So uh, we still have some time for the governor to put some concrete on those proposals. Hmm. I thought all bills were supposed to be submitted already. If it isn't submitted now, can it be submitted later? Oh, that happens. That happens all the time. Uh, even if a, a bill is not submitted by the so-called bill submission deadline, what happens is. Uh, a number of legislators submit uh, bills with generic titles and no content. Uh, so if they really want to uh, have a, a bill that's not there to for introduced uh, be, become part of the legislative process, it's very easy for that uh, legislator to hold a hearing, uh, have the bill amended to insert specific content, and then off we go. Why does that strike me? So the, let me get this straight. The deadline of, 
applies to some some people but not others, some bills but not others. Well, why is that the, the deadline, um, you know, uh, inconsistent that way? Well, I mean, it's just being prepared. The deadline is over already, right? Right. Hmm. Okay, anyway, so let's make the comparison. Um, we, we have now a statement uh, along the lines of changing the tax code in the state of Hawaii. And that's different uh, from what the governor was saying when he was running his campaign. Can you talk about that? Sure. Right, right now, uh, according to uh, media, uh, the governor is walking back on those proposals a little bit. Now he's talking about uh, giving us a rebate for another year. Uh, just like how in this past year, uh, we get we we got rebates of between a hundred and three hundred dollars uh, per qualified exemption on uh, your twenty twenty one tax return. They're looking at something uh, for your twenty twenty two tax return. Of course, that has yet to be fleshed out, and of course, it's going to go through some changes when it goes through, goes through the legislative committees. But the problem with that. Uh, is that's going to be a one-year thing. It's temporary. And the, the uh, tax issues that we have are more permanent. We, you know, we see a lot of uh, taxes that, are, that start out as temporary taxes but become permanent, and they, and they create lasting effects. I, I won't say damage, I'll say effects. Uh, and how can you reverse the effects? Uh, not by a temporary measure. And that seems to be what the legislature uh, wants to gravitate towards at this point, something temporary. You know, but it's all a lot of background of um, our fiscal health in general, seems to me. And when you come up with a, a brand new proposal right out of the January box here, to give uh, $300 to everybody. Um, are you really addressing the larger issues about you know, infrastructure and resilience and to extreme weather, which we know is coming? Um, you know, about the homeless, which you know, costs money to fix the homeless problem. Um, I mean, in fact, every problem, you can make a list of every issue and it, pick, it costs money. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't brought the uh, employee's retirement system up current either. There's, there's uh, hundreds of millions or billions yet due under the law uh, as contributions to the employee's retirement system. Um, so there's all of these obligations, some liquidated, some unliquidated, have yet to be paid, and we really don't have the funds to pay them or the prospect of pay them. Um, and, and now we're going to give $300 to each, uh, each taxpayer um, where there is no indication that I know of um, that we're in a kind of situation where we need to do that. It just sounds like it's a it's a stroke for old fashioned popularity. Well, and that's ha half of what politics is. Uh, old fashioned popularity. Oh, yeah. well, what you're saying is it's a political move. It's not a fiscal move. Yeah, uh, we we have a surplus this year that's been widely publicized, and certainly there are going to be some expectations from voters for lawmakers to do something about that. Uh, the, uh, the lawmakers that I spoke to in the Capitol say, well, you know, surpluses don't last forever. There's no, you know, it's, it's not a recurring thing. And I said, look, you do have recurring revenue. It's called taxes. Uh, the, the question then becomes, how much of that is you going to spend? Well, if you, okay, if you spend but more than going back in, to my course, point. Going to have you problems. say you say we have a surplus. Okay, let's let's assume on a strict mathematical basis we have a surplus. But in terms of planning, in terms of socking it away for risks and liabilities we know are coming down the pike, it's not really a surplus at all. Uh, we should be planning for the future. Uh, Hawaii is not known for its ability and its history of planning. Um, so, uh, isn't that kind of um, sort of a strict interpretation of surplus. We have it right now. We'll give it away right now. And we won't pay the bills. And we won't, you know, sock it away for a time when we know we will have to pay the piper. 
Yeah, that's that's true. But we also have present problems, including, you know, people aren't making it now. They have two or three jobs. They can't pay the bills. So they're buying one way tickets and they're and they're, and they're flying out of here. Uh, we have a new study from the Tax Foundation, the national one that just came out, and it ha highlighted the states that are losing population, the ones that are gaining population, and the ones that are about the same. Uh, we are clearly in the losing population bucket, and the conclusion that the Tax Foundation people drew from the, the census statistics uh, is that people are moving from high tax states to low tax states. And they cited you know, us, us as an example of the former. Yeah, I've seen a number of articles uh, about that, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, Grassroot Institute. And, um, and I think we all know people who've left and who are considering leaving. They sell their house if they have one and uh, go to another state where life is cheaper, and prices are cheaper, and so forth. And it's been happening a long time, but it seems to be accelerating now. But I mean, how does the, of course, when they leave, they're not part of the tax base. But but how does this, um, you know, cash burning a hole in our pockets, how, how can you keep them here um, with that cash? What steps, what measures will keep them here? Well, I would think that, that we need some kind of, you know, permanent type of tax relief. You know, lawmakers from 2008, from 2012, uh, even as recently as last year, um, well, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, they were saying, look, you know, we're, we're in a tough situation now. Voters, can you please tighten your belts a little bit? You know, implying, of course, that the pain would be temporary, but it never it was never temporary. Yeah. Well, it the seems to me that people permanent. people, you know, they they leave Hawaii but for various reasons. Tax is not the only one. Housing, you know, big thing. Um and and various other problems that we have not solved. Yeah. So yeah, was uh, Josh Green saying mm -hmm during his campaign that he would reduce taxes and by how much? And, and the reduction that he was talking about, was that equivalent to $300 per taxpayer or more or less? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, he, he had talked about dramatic changes, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, dropping the GET on food and medicine. You know, both of those are, are kind of very, um, ill-defined terms. Food can be, you know, you can buy food at a grocery store, you can buy food at McDonald's, you can buy food at a high-end restaurant. Is the exemption intended to encompass all three? Probably not. Uh, and, and then how do you, do, how do you uh, draw the lines between each of those? Uh, we also have existing exemptions. Like we have an exemption already on the books for the GET for purchases made uh, using the, uh, it used to be food stamps and now, and now there's a more uh, modern version of it, the WIC program, uh, for example. So the exemption's already there. And we have credits on the income tax side for uh, people who uh, need, uh, need the help who are on the lower end of the income spectrum. They can, okay, well, at there, least in theory, file for credits on the income tax system. I say in theory uh, because those aren't the kind of people who, who are going to file income tax returns, nor are they going to you know, pick up and navigate through exceedingly complicated forms, which, uh, which typically those credit, uh, those credit forms are. So when he says this, he doesn't really know how much the state is going to, you know, uh, lose in taxes when he says he's going to offer food and drugs or any of the other things you mentioned. And um, <clears throat> some, something happened between the time that he made those statements in the course of the campaign and now when he 
is not making those statements about tax relief, but rather just a, 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 an arbitrary dollar amount of refund. I really wonder how that was calculated. So, so Tom, here's the question. What happened? What happened to change this from the campaign to the reality? Well, my guess is that, that some legislative leaders beat them up. Figuratively, saying of what? course. Why and saying what? Uh, Gov, this ain't working. This ain't going to happen. It's, it's, it's going to cost too much. I mean, even Sylvia may have told him that. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke. She was in there uh, for a very long time as as head of finance in the House of Representatives, and she would she would know. And she, yeah, she would. She she's an expert in, in fiscal policy for sure. Um, she was chair of that committee for a long time in the House. So okay, uh, this raises a, a larger issue, okay? and I'm and I'm not saying that George Santos is uh, you know on the platform here today in our show. I'm only saying the question is whether the statements made by a candidate, um, you know, are are statements we can and should rely on, and and there's something stark about uh, campaign statements that are made just before the election, and then you get to a time just after the election, and they are remarkably changed. And in the meantime, uh, I'm sure there are people out there, uh, you know, if we did a little survey, we'd find out, who relied on those campaign statements, who thought that that, that that particular official, if elected, would follow through on campaign promises, you know, promises. Well, um, there's, a, there's a couple of issues there. I mean, number one, uh, just talking about an exemption for food and medicine, those are, those are vague terms. Uh, how much food is exempt? How much medicine exempt? Is it more or less what's already exempt? You know, we don't know. Um, and, and second, and, and the governor has kind of gone down to saying this, you know, go down this road as well. He, he's saying, look, I'll, I'll, I've, I told you I'd fight for it and I will fight for it. Not that it's going to pass, but I'll fight for it. Well, what does fight for it mean? Good question. Maybe the governor's office will testify in favor of it. And then, it, and then it'll quietly die. That's mm. what happens. That's yeah. not a good sound. Not a good sound. So, you know, part of this, I would say, is the press. And the press did play a role, or a non-role, if you will, uh, in the George Santos uh, case. I mean, one Long Island uh, um, newspaper uh, found, found him out and published a series of articles about his embellishments. Uh, but the big national papers didn't think it was important or they didn't catch it. And um, so the Times never repeated those articles until after the election. And the same thing with the Washington Post and other national papers. So the press really didn't do its job here. Uh, one Long Island, uh, you know, uh, small paper is not going to be enough to really make people aware. Now, in this case, <clears throat> You know, the press could have been asking questions like, what do you mean fight for it? And what are the details of that? Because the devil is in the details. And how do you calculate that in terms of fiscal planning? <clears throat> and the press, I, I'm, I don't know for sure, but the press didn't really ask those questions. And so or, uh, or uh, campaign they, they statements. Say, Look, you know, uh, <clears throat> deadline to choose the governor's packages February X, and, and you will see all details by then. Right. But would, wouldn't it have been better if somebody in a press conference asked those questions now, immediately, when the statements were made? Oh, I'm sure it would have been. Yeah. I don't know what the answer would have been. I mean, uh, probably would have been some, uh, some, some form of, you know, what I just mentioned. You know, you will see all details later. That's yeah. kind of like the way politics is sometimes. Yeah. Well, but it does it does raise the question of the role of the press in testing statements made by candidates. Because I and I think if you I mean I'm not talking about Hawaii necessarily, but if you look at George Santos, he's probably not alone 
the degree of embellishment um, you know that he engaged in was that was unique but I'm sure if you went candidate by candidate across the country you would find a lot of embellishments made on the curricula vitae um, and on you know positions and and promises um, would be would be different and um, and the press needs to bear in on that everywhere um, because I think if if you have a government that's based on statements during a campaign that that we're not are not going to come true um, you're really not getting what you bargained for you're not getting what you voted for so uh, has there been you know here we are today on think tech talking about these temporary tax fixes, temporary is euphemistic, um, and, uh, you know, comparing them against the campaign promises, has the press covered this issue? Um, where, where, you know, you're getting it, I think, from talking to people, but what about the press? Have they been reporting on it? Uh, there, there's been a little reporting on it. I've seen stuff on Hawaii News now, for example, uh, it's, it's, but it's very recent. So, it may be that just kind of waiting for more details uh, before, you know, uh, trying to put their bully pulpit hat on or, you know, putting putting the screws to one side or the other. You know, the press has a lot of power because people do make statements that they can't back up and uh, or they don't intend to back up worse. Um, and also, you know, the public has a, a memory like a sieve. And, um, you know, the, the, the press has a, a very heavy obligation in these times. And so, you know, I'm thinking it's not just statements made in the course of campaigns. It's not just curricula vitae, you know, what have you done with your life? Um, it's statements made from day to day. It's statements informing the public where there's such a great opportunity to do uh, misinformation and disinformation in order to achieve some political benefit. And so, you know, the, the question is, um, is this limited to campaign promises? Or perhaps it goes beyond that. Perhaps it goes, you know, beyond that in the sense that whatever a, a sitting official says has to be tested in the same way. You agree? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, if it's like anything else, people can say later on that what they were mentioning uh, was an aspirational goal or... Uh, you know, a, a prediction of what life might be, you know, if A, B, C, and D came together, which, you know, it hardly ever happens. Uh, but but they, they don't tell you the latter part. Uh, as a, a voter and, and as a, a person trying to deal with the state, uh, you need to be very careful about what you actually do rely on. Uh, I, I wouldn't rely on campaign promises, uh, except to put, you know, more pressure on the candidates uh, slash elected officials to deliver on them. Uh, we we'd want to see the goods. Like, wh what's the bill going to say? Is the bill going to be approved? And if the bill is approved, will you sign the darn thing? So, is there any you refer relief, for example? Uh, that can be done now, uh, even on the national level. Uh, the last couple of presidents uh, didn't necessarily wait for the legislative body. You know, they issued a bunch of executive orders. Uh, David Ige was no exception. Uh, and he had much more opportunity to do that because of the pandemic. Uh, but, but governors do have a lot of power administratively. Yeah, and there's the power of the, the bully pulpit. You know, when they get, they get up there and the state seal is behind them and they make a statement, people on the 6 o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news are inclined to believe them. They're inclined to accept it as the gospel. And the questions that come out of the, the press, if, if there are questions permitted, are not necessarily all that probative. And the problem is that um, you, you referred to it, is it? The individual citizen has to apply critical thinking. And uh, uh, if we don't do that, then we wind up getting a, a kind of um, um, a, a, a dynamic truth, if you will, a dynamic truth. You heard it here, uh, which changes. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> so from press conference to press conference, the world is different. And, and so somebody has to call that out. And, and at the end of the day, it's the individual consumer of news that has to call it out. I mean, we can call it out here, uh, but it's up to the individuals uh, who are the consumers of news to do something about it. You know, are they going to you know, vote differently? Are they going to um, you know, support uh, you know, candidates or people or, or nonprofits uh, as a result? Just as just as some examples. Yeah, and you know, there's also this very interesting issue about re-election. So now we have another campaign. And in that campaign, a given official will say, look at all my achievements. I did this, I did that, I did that, I did this. That's that's why you should vote for me again. Okay, but in fact, you have to measure those statements against the promises. Um, if if the campaign if the uh, campaigner promised this that and the other thing, and he doesn't talk about the fact um, that they don't come true, that he did not achieve those things, somebody has to point that out. He's going to tell you what he has achieved, uh, and maybe you know with some embellishment, and he is not going to tell you what he has not achieved. So somebody has to write that up. And I don't know if our media is into that. Is it? Well, I mean, it does to some extent. I mean, it's really the duty of the opposition candidate, uh, if there is one. Um, and that's perhaps part of our problem. We don't have, uh, you know, we have a lot of uncontested elections. Yeah. Well, I, you know, all this is a test of uh, of the system, I would say. And it has been happening on the mainland. And when you see uh, people making promises or uh, claims about their background and, and it's not true or it doesn't come true, you you have to you have to come up with uh, a either the system isn't working or or b the individual member of the system the you know the, the voter um, has to has to be his own guardian or her own guardian. Um, that the voter has to take a, a, an active role in, in, um, in, in, uh, in vetting all those public statements. And uh, I, think, I think we've learned that the press is not always on top of things. And we have learned certainly that the opposing candidate is not necessarily on top of things. So you have to go in there being... Um, very critical in your thinking and, and even cynical uh, to say, well, he just said this and he just said that. Uh, should I accept that? Should I not accept that? And, and furthermore, and this is a part of democracy, I think we have, you know, like lost. Uh, and that is discussions with others who are also watching this news. Um, discussions with guys like you, Tom where we can sit here and bat it back and forth. And, you know, I, I don't have to be right. I just want to hear what you have to say. I want to throw propositions at you and, and see you react. I want to be in a crucible of discussion with you. And, and in, in, a, in a world of uh, silos, in a world of social media, where one person can uh, speak to millions, um, we don't have that kind of living room chat. And... If, I think it would be better if we did. Yeah, no, crucibles of discussion are great for democracy. That's one of the principles uh, that our democracy, among others, was founded upon. And that would be a great thing. Yeah. Well, Tom, um, this is going to be an interesting session. I don't think this is the only area that's going to be of interest. There are you know, at least a dozen areas in the legislature. And uh, we cannot forget that the, there should be a connection between the governor's office and the legislature at all points during the session. And uh, this administration knows that full well because they've both been involved in the legislature for years. And so um, there's plenty to watch, um, and especially in the fiscal department. Because just as you say, it's, it's not only that people are voting with their feet and leaving because they think taxes are too high, 
or on the other side of the equation, um, prices are too high. Either way, tax is a price. Um, or that there are problems in housing or public safety or health or infrastructure or environment, you name it. There's lots of reasons why they would leave. And we look to the legislature to identify these things and take uh, affirmative steps to make life better here in these islands. And all of those things should be on the table. All of them cost money. And at the end of the day, fiscal policy uh, is what drives the individual voter citizen to stay here or not. Don't you agree? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think there are a lot of issues that the government should be looking at. Uh, most or all of them in, involve money. And that's why we, uh, among others, concentrate on uh, fiscal policy and taxation uh, because that's kind of the, the big choke point here. I enjoy your choice of words on that. Ladies and gentlemen, he said choke point. We all heard him say that. Thank you very much, Tom. Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, doing good work for all of us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on the show. Aloha. And I don't know what this damn thing is doing, but... Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Where's it? If you like what we here. do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. I'm not sure how the clip works. Mahalo. So.